fact, we thought originally we anticipated that the the scour events over Conowingo Dam would have a much greater impact on main stem Chesapeake Bay. We all thought that. I thought that. However, the new science is showing otherwise, and it, what it's doing is it's amplifying what I've known all along, and that is that you better address it locally, because if you want clean water locally, you're going to find clean water through activities you take locally. And unfortunately, this notion that we could point at Conowingo and say they're the guilty culprit, apparently that's not the case. So the more you can control the flow of water locally, the more you can control agricultural runoff, and also the more you can buffer those streams so that your last line of defense is essentially a riparian, uh, a forested buffer immediately adjacent to the shoreline, that has enormous ability to act like a sponge and capture moving sediment that could otherwise smother the oyster. And what you've seen, I've seen it all the time on, on the Chester River, is we're losing those forested buffers. We also have ditches. And those ditches, they actually bisect those, those uh, uh, riparian buffers. And so then what happens is the ditches collect the surface flow that would have otherwise gone through the forest and been caught. And instead, it's a direct flume into the water. So again, what I say is Conowingo is a huge issue, and we need to be addressing it but also to point the finger upstream when, in fact, some of the most egregious violations are happening in Maryland and Virginia is not right. Yes, 41% is coming from the Susquehanna, and let's take a careful look at that. The other is that means that 59% is not coming from the Susquehanna, and let's take a careful look at that. So first, let's take a look at the 41%. The 41 percent, when you think about it, Pennsylvania has some of the most extensive forests in the watershed. Two-thirds of the watershed in Pennsylvania is forested, compared to, say, in Maryland, where it's less than half. Okay? So you have to say, okay, it's probably not the forest then, but in the forest, what's happening? Well, we do have fracking going on and we do have extensive sand and gravel roads. So one thing we have to do is take a really careful look at what's going on to manage the drainage from those gravel roads. The more we can manage that drainage in Pennsylvania, the less nutrients and sediment will come off them into the Susquehanna and even have the opportunity to build up behind Conowingo. So a huge part of the solution of that 41 percent is appropriate management in the watershed. Sewage treatment plants in Pennsylvania. MS4s in Pennsylvania. What can we do with the urban runoff? All those things are really, really important in Pennsylvania to address the nutrient flow coming across the dam. Do you think Pennsylvania is serious about this? Uh, I think that all three states are serious, and I think all three states, at least our member states, have not done enough. Pennsylvania had some of the most progressive nutrient management legislation in, in the region. They had it first, and they had it aggressively. You don't always hear about that. Um, uh, I think that Pennsylvania needs improvements. They need um, better stream exclusion, for example, initiatives to keep the livestock out of the streams. That would be a good example. They need improvements to some of their uh, sand and gravel road uh, operations. All of us need more. All of us. But the question is, are we doing enough? Here's the thing with Conowingo. First of all, there are many stream, many storms that don't affect Conowingo Dam. Sandy. Nothing happened after Sandy in terms of the scouring on Conowingo Dam. But 14 years earlier, we did have... With Lee, with, with it Lee. was massive. Right. 
with Lee, okay, or Agnes, massive. So some of it depends upon where the storm is placed. Now for Sandy, we should have been focusing on all the scour and all the sediment that came down into the Chesapeake Bay, but south of the Susquehanna River. But it seems very convenient to point the finger at the Conowingo. The other thing is that to dredge the Conowingo Dam, some of the estimates, what is it? It's 496 million to 2.8 billion dollars. And then of course, it'll start filling up again. So the question becomes, what's better to really invest that money in best management practices up in the watershed that's going to reduce that flow coming into Conowingo Dam or to dredge the dam? They've looked at dredging. We've all looked at dredging. And in fact, there are some quarries nearby and one of the things that was very carefully analyzed is could you take some of that very wet slurry and pipe it to these nearby quarries, fill the quarries in for essentially land reclamation. And you need to understand that this would be an absolutely wet, soupy solution similar to pudding when you're first making it. Not when it's made, but when you're first making it. What they've seen is that to get it back to 1996 conditions behind Conowingo, so what they have from their bathymetric studies was actually there in 1996, so don't think a, a full clean situation behind the dam, but what they've seen is that you could uh, get that much removed, which would end up being about 10% which ends up being about 25, uh, 25 million tons of sediment removed. But the cost is somewhere between 500 million and 2.8 billion. And remember, what I told you is that as so long as there is sediment coming into the watershed, it will replace itself. So that's not a one-time investment. That's as soon as it fills up again, then of course you have these scours going on every three to four years with a big storm, mm -hmm. which is why it makes so much more sense to deal with the sources in the watershed and to make sure that we have forested buffers, that we have cows out of the streams, that we have best management practices in our in our cities and our townships, and then we're not growing, you know, with uncontrolled sprawl. Those are the things that are contributing to nutrients and sediment, and that's where it makes the most sense to invest those dollars. Now, what's very difficult in the Chesapeake Bay region right now is looking at what's happening with elected officials, in that elected officials are under a lot of pressure. They're under pressure to basically pay for the cleanup. And to pay for the cleanup, the people have to be willing to pay, and the people are the ones who elect them. And so that's a difficult situation right now because everybody wants clean water, everybody wants strong living resources, but the question is who will pay and how will we pay? And because elected officials have, have job interviews every four years, you know, it puts them at risk. So we as a people, we need to make sure that we're sending strong signals to our elected officials that it's okay to pay for clean water, that that's something we're willing to pay for. You know, what I really hope is that local governments more and more realize the local nature of uh, water pollution and habitat destruction and that more local governments take it upon themselves to, to make that the signature of their town and their county. For a long time we've had growth as our measure of success and obviously you can't grow your way out of trouble. You can't. We're at the point now where you can't any longer and so instead the more local governments that really realize that sustainability 
is something that's going to make their local community very attractive and that the people will greatly enjoy clean water and living resources. Um, that, that's the day when the Chesapeake's going to be healthy again. And so if I have a, a angst, it's how do we, how do we get 1,800 local governments to really be embracing that? And I think my answer is, you know, one at a time. And leadership comes from a few courageous individuals or populations doing something right. And what I really hope is that the local governments really do decide this is what we want to do. We want to focus locally.